Shall we pray together? Our God and our Father, we give you thanks. We worship you. We thank you for this morning that you've gathered us together for a purpose, Lord. We thank you for the commissioning that Jesus did to Peter as he left him in the world to feed the sheep and also to feed the lamb and to take care of them. Father, thank you because this mandate continues to be our mandate until today. We give you thanks for in Jesus Christ we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We welcome each one of us in the presence of the Lord and we thank you so much for coming. We pray that the Lord will give us a blessed time together as we worship. Our topic this morning is understanding the ministry or, and gift of pastorship. We continue to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and we look at the fivefold ministries and we've been going on analyzing each one of them at a time. And today we are looking at pastorship. But before I do that, I also just want to remind us that today is Trinity Sunday. And uh, for many of us, we realize that Trinity is one of those seasons in the church that lasts for 21 to 23 weeks. It's the longest. And it's just, I'm just going to give a brief of the Trinity and then that will lead me in the topic of the day. Uh, from the time of Christmas, we begin to look at the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnation, God becoming man. The birth of Jesus brings good information to us that God decides to look at this, looked at the sinful status of man and chose to come down and dwell among man. And his dwelling among us, among us brings him in the person of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, just a few uh, weeks ago, we celebrated the ascension, looking at Jesus Christ completing his work by dying on the cross and therefore ascending back into glory. And last Sunday, we were celebrating the Pentecost Sunday. So this God who is three persons in one comes to us because of our sinful nature and identifies with us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ does his work. God lives among us in the person of Jesus Christ. He goes on the cross. He dies for us. And after his death, he transcends and goes ascends to heaven. And when he ascends to heaven, he tells his disciples, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back again in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be with you for the rest of the time. And so um, we look at the Trinity in that context, not looking at three persons, but looking at God in three persons um, appearing to do, to do, to perform his role amongst his people in different seasons. And so the Trinity does not bring to us three individuals, but it brings to us God in three persons. And the three persons work in unity. When you read the Gospels, especially from chapters 15 of the Gospel of John, through up to the time when Jesus goes to the cross, you realize that he talks about himself not doing anything without the Father. The Father is in me and I am in him. When we read the creeds, they bring this analogy very clear. When you read the Athanasius Creed, the creed that many of us do not read, he says that we worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity. The Nicene Creed, which we recite every other Sunday, talks about Jesus being of one substance with the Father. It talks about very God of very God, begotten, not made one in being with the Father, and through him all things were made. So this is the whole area of the Trinity. So 
The Trinity is symbolized the first Sunday is white, but the rest of the Sunday through up to November, you're going to be seeing us putting on the green stalls, symbolizing life. It is a time of ministry. It is a time of the power of the Holy Spirit manifesting his glory among the people. And so we are going to see God working in among us, among us. It's a time of mission. It's a time of new life. People receiving a new life because God is at work. And when you look at the book of Acts, it symbolizes the ministry and the work of the Trinity. That after the Holy Spirit has come down, now the ministry begins in full swing. So I want to continue as we celebrate the 23 weeks of the Trinity. We want to pray that God will continue to use us together. But friends, as we talk about the Trinity, it's just worth for us to understand the ministry and the gift of pastorship. For who leads us as we look at this ministry, it is the pastor. And that is why today it's just pertinent that we look at the ministry and gift of a pastor. Many of us, when we talk about a pastor, it doesn't seem to be a biblical word. It looks like this is just any other Pentecostal pastor who rises up and begins to lead the church. It's not so. The Bible talks about the gift of pastorship, and that is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. And some of us will ask a question, what about this whole word of reverend? What about the bishop? What about, you know, there are all those ranks that come in church. When I am an archdeacon, it's just a title of administration. When I'm a bishop, it's a title of administration. When I'm an archbishop, it's a title of administration. But the underlying title for all of us is pastor. We must be pastors. If I become a bishop and I'm not a pastor, I lose direction. Because we are called to be pastors. The Bible will talk about overseers, it will talk about elders, it will talk about shepherd, and it's the same Greek word that brings all those words. And therefore, the underlying word that we are talking about is the gift of pastorship. The word reverend is a title that was given to church leaders. Actually, originally in the 15th century, it was a term of respectful address to people. But then later in the 17th century, it was specifically attached to ordained clergy. And when you read in scripture, you discover that reverend was a reference for God himself. And therefore, that is where it is attributed to ordained clergy, ordained ministers. And ordained ministers are supposed to set a godly example in word and deed. Because they are representatives of God, to, to guide the flock and to lead the congregation that God has given them. And so when you look at, um, uh, you look at the word pastor, it comes together with the teachers, pastors and teachers, and some versions put it as pastors or teachers being the same gift. To some extent, all pastors are supposed to be teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. Praise the Lord. Yes, or else school teachers might assume that they are pastors. They are not. So pastors are supposed to be teachers, although it can happen that a pastor might not be a teacher, might not be a good teacher, but not all teachers are pastors. So pastorship is a special gift given to lead a local church with the abilities given by God. A pastor is supernaturally called by God to oversee a group of believers. The pastor is to stand in a place as a teaching elder. 
And that makes the pastor to be knowledgeable. And that is why today you are not seeing pastors for the sake of being a pastor to stand before you in the congregation and they have not gone to school. They must go to school. They must study. They must understand the word. Because how do you teach what you do not know? You know, sometimes you, the, the Christians, come and tell us, but these things we know. I want to assure you, you don't know. Because you remember, yes, you know the word of God, but I went to class for this particular ministry. And it is a calling from God. So there are things you know where you can be at my level, but I want to assure you that there are things that I am above your level, just as I cannot pretend to be a lawyer. Even when I have a little knowledge of what to say in court, I cannot say, but I'm also a judge. No, I am not, because that is not my area of operation. And therefore, pastorship is a special gift given to by, uh, to, uh, by God to us. And so a pastor can be called a shepherd, can be a bishop. And so, um, as I have mentioned, is that that word, pastor, can be translated uh, shepherd. And so, as Paul was speaking to the elders in Ephesus, this is what he said to them. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased by his own blood. That puts a pastor, he says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And so the pastorship office or gift is not to be a self-made office. It is the Lord who gives you a particular flock for a particular time. And that is why, friends, we get transfers. Because when my worker expires here, the Lord is going to take me to another flock because that is where he wants me to serve at that particular season. And many of us have asked this question, especially when I get a transfer from all saints to another church. Some of us begin to ask, is that a demotion? There is no promotion and there is no demotion in ministry. You are a pastor. And you are not allocated to pastor a congregation of a certain category. You are supposed to pastor all congregations because that is where the Holy Spirit has allocated you. So when I live here and the Holy Spirit directs my bishop that I'm going to go to St. Nicholas Kalerwe, don't begin to ask what a demotion. It's not a demotion. The church in St. Nicholas Kalerwe needs my gift there. And I should be able to go there and serve the Lord in that place. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what am I saying? The pastor is an overseer of God's flock. The pastor is to teach and guide the local congregation. The pastor is supposed to equip and enable the believers to do the work of ministry. And that is why in that reading, Jesus is commissioning Peter and he's saying, feed my lambs. He says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's telling him the lambs are the little ones. The sheep are the big ones. You know, he's telling him all of them are mine. And therefore, I am commissioning you to go out and feed them. That's why, friends, when you are inviting us, you don't have to think, but will the, will the provost sit in this house of mine? You are all the sheep and the lambs and the flock that the Lord has entrusted to all these ministers. And we are supposed to go everywhere without isolating who is who. But you are all children of God. 
And so when Jesus was telling Peter, he did not isolate and say, these are the lambs in this category. These ones will be in this category. He said, feed my lambs. That is it. That is the work of a pastor. He's an overseer of God's flock. Just as a physical shepherd must feed the sheep so they do not starve, a pastor must feed the people of God with the spiritual food so that they can grow stronger. Our work is to feed the flock, to give the spiritual food so that we grow stronger in Christ. We are supposed to disciple the flock. We are supposed to take care of the dying. We are supposed to lift the sick. We, we are supposed to pray with those that are grieving, those that are burdened. Many times the question is, should all saints be a church to bury the dead? We have had these questions. We don't bury them here. <laughs> but we minister to the grieving souls. We minister to the grieving souls. We minister to those that are broken. We minister to those that are hurting. And that is the work and ministry of a pastor. Pastors, secondly, are supposed to be examples. Peter mentions this very vividly in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 through 3. He says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. Praise the Lord. Not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Dear brothers and sisters, many times if we fail to be examples, and I'll be mentioning that later again. If we fail to be examples to the flock, then we are dishonoring the God who has called us to oversee and to look after you. We are dishonoring the mandate that God has given us. And so we must be examples as we oversee the flock that God has given us. We must be willing. That is why sometimes you can be very tired and they tell you there is a vigil somewhere. And you look around and say, okay, I am going to go. It's not because you do not have what to do. It's not because you are not tired after a long day, but because the Lord has given you a willing spirit to serve the people of God. The willingness is very important among us. Not because you must, but because you are Willing, the willingness comes from God to be able to step out and serve the people of God because it's a calling you have to live out as an example, not greedy for money. Praise be to the Lord. I found a policy in all saints which I love that when money is collected here, no priest touches that money. Amen. Some people come to us to beg for money because they think this whole basket is ours. It is not. We do not touch this money. What we touch is after it has gone to the bank and the treasurer deems to say this is the, my salary and it goes direct to my account. That is when I touch this money. And so the greed for money, that I'm going to touch that basket and use it for my own personal needs, is not supposed to be the portion of the pastor. The pastor is supposed to do the work of God, and the rest, the Lord takes over. And that's why, friends, we've seen many of you have been in churches out there. When it comes to a point of the salary of the pastor to be increased, many of us say no. 
It's not right. Why are they eating our money? Why are they taking a lot of money? The pastor's salary should not be increased. Friends, we go to the same supermarkets with you. Hallelujah. Yes. We take the children in the same schools with you. And I'll be measuring that later in my conclusion. The pastor is to be a servant of Christ to shepherd the congregation. He is not to be a tyrant or dictator, but to provide spiritual leadership. He is supposed to serve the people and not to be served. He or she should follow the example of Jesus who came to serve and not to be served. The pastor must be a servant of the Lord. You know, many times, this is just an example, that when we are going to eat, you begin to say, ah, the, the, the pastors first, if you don't go, we are not going. Friends, you've made us disobey. We are supposed to eat after you. That is the right way for a pastor. The pastor is supposed to be a servant. He's supposed to serve and not to be served. We are supposed to show the example of service. We are supposed to show the example of humility. Matthew chapter 20 verse 28, even as the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. So the pastor is supposed to be a servant and that is why you have seen in some congregation and elsewhere recently there was a scandal in Kumi and the pastor was beaten out of the church by the younger people. And when the pastor was beaten, it was not because Anita so many didn't have strength to fight. But it's because this was the flock. That even when you beat me, I will not beat you back because you are the flock. I am the shepherd. And we pray always that God gives us the humility that even when you come with the fire, I will have water. There are so many things that boil up and they boil up, but we are supposed to have shock absorbers. Why? Because we are called to be humble. A servant of the Lord is called to be humble. And therefore, sometimes you get humble. Even when you are beaten, abused, falsely accused, you need to remain silent. Not because you are powerless, but because you are the shepherd to the flock. So we need to know the role and the ministry. You know, Jesus called that would have called the fire to consume the Jews who killed him. But he allowed them to do whatever they wanted. Isaiah talks about him as a sheep going to be slaughtered. And that is the emulation that goes around when you see a pastor being humiliated for nothing. Some of us are humiliated because we have problems. But when you see someone being humiliated for nothing, you know, they are trying to hold their position as servants. Paul gives several qualities of a pastor in Titus chapter 2. He says, for an overseer, as God must be, um, live as God is steward. You have to keep God's resources and everything secure, including the people. You must be blameless. You must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain. These things are biblical. Not addicted to wine, not violent, not greedy for gain. We must be hospitable, lovers of goodness, prudent, upright, devout, self-controlled. So these are the qualities that must be exhibited. That is why, friends, if you found me in a bar with a bottle of beer, come and tell me, my pastor, this bottle is not yours. I will not have the moral authority to stop you from drinking if I drink together with you. And please, if you ever drink, you don't drink together with a pastor. Tell them this is not your. Portion. 
It's not our portion. We have to run away from it. Praise the Lord. And so this is what he says. We need not to be addicted to wine. We need not to be violent, no greedy. We must have self-control. We must have self-control. We must know how to control ourselves and control our passions, our desires. You know, many people, when you see a pastor falling into sin, then you say, but all men do it. <laughs> it's not general for pastors that they should do it. Praise the Lord. It's not. They have to be disciplined because as we join the ministry, we know that we must subject our bodies to total self-control. And so you should not join us to sympathize and say, but they are all human. Yes, we are human. But we have a level of reverence that God has given us that must set us apart. To be able to serve the Lord and to live as a living example. The gift of a pastor is not a profession. It is a calling. You can't just join because you didn't have what to do and you saw money in being a pastor. Friends, you will not serve. You join because God has called you. And for all of us as pastors, we must have a testimony. How did you start this journey? When you realize that our testimony is vague, there is something wrong. There has to be a testimony of the calling into ministry. How did the Lord call you? And friends, when you are called into ministry, it does not matter what you go through, you will never give up. Even when you are put in a congregation which is like a fire, you will never give up ministry because it's a calling. One day as I was beginning ministry, my father was a priest. He has rested in the Lord. I was going through a situation with the congregation and my father came and looked at me and said, you know, you people call me Rebecca. My father used to call me Margaret. He looked into my face and said, Margaret, I didn't tell you so much. I wanted to be sure that this is a calling on your heart to join ministry. But now that you have joined, never walk out. I thought he was going to sympathize with me. He said, you know what? Never walk out. So friends, those words, it's now about five years since my father passed on. Those words are in my ears. I will never walk out because it is a calling. It is not a profession. And because it is a calling, I must abide with all it is challenges and walk through it committedly because I must give account to the God who called me. Hallelujah. So being a pastor has to be a calling. It's not an appointment by any human being, but rather an appointment by God. And if God has called a person to be a pastor of a local church, that calling will be recognized. The pastor acts, acts on behalf of Christ, who himself is the head of the church. And this is what we see in Colossians chapter 1, 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he must have supremacy. So when it is a calling, then this calling must be upheld because I'm not working on my own, I am working for the one who is the head of the church. And the head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. And therefore, I'm following him. If he conquered, I must also conquer. Because the life is not mine. It's about Jesus who called me into this ministry. 
Praise be to the Lord. You can also read that in Ephesians chapter 5, where the church, the, the Christ is looked at as the head of the, the head of the church, as the husband is the head of the wife. And that is where we keep saying every husband must take responsibility of being a pastor in that home. Because it's a duty that is assigned to you by God. As I conclude, as the pastors play their role, what is the obligation of the flock to the pastors? First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 12 says, Now we ask you brothers and sisters to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in highest regard, in love, because of their work. That is our duty, our responsibility to the ministers. Acknowledge them. Recently I had a statement and I said, wow. I had a statement of a head of late saying, I didn't understand that you are also a pastor. It looks so village. Yeah, and I asked this pastor, what did you say? He said, I kept it quiet because I'm not village. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, but what he's saying is your responsibility as the flock is to acknowledge those who work hard among you. Acknowledging has so many things, even just saying thank you for the good work that you are doing. And you people encourage us a lot. We really appreciate you. When you say thank you for what you are doing, we know that we are doing ministry and that gives us a minute to move a little harder. And it says, hold them in highest regard, in love for their work. But it also says, live in peace with each other. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, he says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. You know, for your part is to have confidence and to submit, but on our part, we must also know that if we go wrong, we must give an account to the one who has given us this work to do. And he says, do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. If you share this work with us, if you have confidence in us, if we can walk together with you as your pastors, then the work ceases to be a burden. It is a blessing because we are blessing one another. First Timothy 5 verses 17 says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of a double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. They are worthy of a double honor. And 1 Corinthians 9, 14 says in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So if you see me kneeling and my shoes is looking at you, don't laugh. Because you, I am supposed to earn my living from where I serve. The best is for you to say, but you know, I saw you wash you can. What, what size do you put on? Amen? Amen. <laughs> yes. Instead of saying, you know, I saw the shirt was just upside down. Upside down. Can you put it upside up? You have a responsibility to look after your ministers. You have a duty. And when you do that, the blessing will come to you from the Lord. When you see them running on border borders and you've kept packed four cars, others are doing nothing, get one and give them and the Lord will bless you. Amen? Amen. Don't say these pastors are so tired. We pay them a lot of money. But now you see them running. It is raining. They are running on border borders. That is what they can afford for the season. Walk with them. Carry them. Pray with them. And the Lord will bless you. Friends, 
the work of a pastor is a noble calling. We, the pastors, and you, the flock, and the congregation, the Lord calls us to hold it together, to handle together, to carry together, to walk together, and be able to serve with in humility and also in reverence to the Lord. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come to you in humility this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for calling us to be pastors. And thank you, Lord, for giving us the congregation and the flock to oversee. Many times our God and our Father, they are pastors, but they do not have a congregation. But they are also congregation who would have loved to have pastors, but they do not have the pastors. Father, we pray that you bless us. Give us the grace, our God and our Father to be a blessing to one another in this ministry. We give you thanks, our God and our Father, for this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you again join me to thank Madame Margaret for the very good summer. I think she has done it. You know, for us who go to college, they take us to retreats. And I remember in 1979, we take, Bishop Koma took us in a retreat. And he talked about the same summer. And Madame Margaret, you have hit the note. Not only to the clergy who have been sitting there, but even to you. In fact, he mentioned, let me repeat because he has done it. He has said the following five points which I want to summarize for you. One, that the gift of a pastor is a calling, not a profession. We are called, not a profession. Secondly, she said, pastor, as servants of Christ, shepherd you. Thirdly, she said, pastors are teachers of the word of God. But not all teachers are pastors. Be warned. <laughs> she also said, pastors, or a pastor is an overseer of the flock of God. And finally, she said at the beginning that even in the context of the Trinity which we are beginning, the Spirit will lead you and me. But finally, because her someone, Madame Margaret, said, she also cautions you that please always acknowledge your pastors. Live in peace with them and each other. Have confidence in us. We want you to have confidence in us. Reprimand us with love. And then share ministry with us. Let us pray. God, again, we want to thank you and thank you for this teaching sermon. A retreat for both pastors here and the congregation. May the words which Madame Margaret said reach each and every us. May it become a double-edged sword to cut across us as we minister to each other. Thank you, God, in the name of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.